All right, so today, our final lecture, we're going to finish off with the autonomic nervous system. And you can see an example here of the autonomic nervous system. And the autonomic nervous system is a series of neurons that feed out to a variety of different types of organs and have automatic self-ruling control over those organs. So the self-ruling control is going to be over things like glands, the cardiac muscle, and smooth muscle in a variety of different locations throughout the body. So the cardiac muscle, we have to change the strength of contraction and we can change the heart rate, even though heart rate is, or uh, uh, heart contraction rather, is self-originating in the heart, we can control how fast the heart beats and we can manipulate that intrinsic uh, beat characteristic through the autonomic nervous system. Or we can control the secretion of certain molecules from different types of glands and then control smooth muscle uh, to help regulate the vascular tone or the uh, movement of food up and down the digestive system. These are just a few examples of autonomic control. The autonomic nervous system is divided into two major divisions. And these two major divisions are going to be the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system. The sympathetic division is going to be the division of the autonomic nervous system that prepares the body for some sort of activity. Uh, frequently, the activity would be referred to as fight or flight. Um, not a great term, but uh, a classical term that uh, many people are aware of. And so the sympathetic division is preparing the organism for activity or for action. And so example here would be prepare the heart to accelerate. It accelerates the heart so that the demands of the activity can be met in oxygen supply and nutrients. The kind of polar opposite of sympathetic is going to be parasympathetic. And the parasympathetic division is going to be the division of the autonomic nervous system that calms the body. So this is going to be what reverses that which was done by the sympathetic division. So if we accelerate heart rate with the sympathetic division, we are going to slow the heart rate with the parasympathetic system. Now, these two divisions, even though they are opposed, they are not independent. So they are not independent systems. And what that means is that we're not just going to have parasympathetic control at some given time and then sympathetic control at another given time. There's actually going to be combinations of both sympathetic and parasympathetic tone at any given time. So both the sympathetic and parasympathetic are activated continually. Now what will change will be the level of activity. So there's going to be a varying degree of activity. This sort of underlying autonomic balance between the sympathetic and parasympathetic is going to be called autonomic tone. And again, it's to varying degrees. And so we're going to actually have circumstances that will shift the overall system magnetically. 
So you're preparing for an exam. This is a somewhat stressful situation, and you're going to have an increase in sympathetic division uh, of the autonomic nervous system. But you are still going to have some parasympathetic nervous system that is activated during that time as well. So what we're going to do now is we're going to talk about the neurotransmission and the neurotransmitters that are used to balance the autonomic nervous system. <clears throat> so we need to start out with what's known as the sympathetic chain. Uh, this is a series of ganglion that run uh, parallel to the spinal column. You can see we have our posterior and our anterior, sp anterior uh roots of our spinal nerve coming off, and then we'll have a uh, portion of that spinal nerve that breaks away into this thing called the sympathetic chain. So in the autonomic nervous system, we are going to have both pre- and post-ganglionic fibers. Pre-ganglionic fibers are the nerve fibers that leave or depart from the spinal cord. They are going to make their way into this structure called the sympathetic chain. This is a series of ganglions coming off of the spinal nerves and runs parallel to the spinal cord. The chain ganglion or the ganglion chain is going to be our anatomical point of contact. between the pre- and post-ganglionic fibers. So our pre-ganglionic fibers are what leave the spinal cord. And then we'll interact here. You can see that we interact within the ganglion to have an interaction between a pre-ganglionic fiber and a post ganglionic fiber. The post ganglionic fiber is going to be the fiber that helps to innervate our organs that are going to be on under autonomic control. So we have basically our pre-fiber and then our ganglion and then leaving that ganglion going to the organs we're going to have our post fiber now within the realm of neurotransmitters within the autonomic nervous system we are going to have single neurotransmitters that have both sympathetic and parasympathetic effects or functions. So as you can see here, here's an example of autonomic nervous system neurotransmitters and neural transmission. Now obviously, the sympathetic function and the parasympathetic function of this single neurotransmitter are going to be different. And so we have different effects, even though we're using the same neurotransmitter. And the reason we can have those different effects is not because of the neurotransmitter, but rather because of the different receptors 
that are going to be associated with sympathetic and parasympathetic fibers. Now, one of the most common uh, of the excreted neurotransmitters in the autonomic nervous system is going to be acetylcholine. So acetylcholine is commonly excreted as the neurotransmitter for both parasympathetic and sympathetic. In fact, we're going to find this all over our sympathetic portion of the autonomic nervous system. And we'll find this primarily as the neurotransmitter of the parasympathetic pre-ganglion fibers. So we'll find them in the sympathetic fibers and then the pre-ganglion of the parasympathetic. In the parasympathetic postganglion, we will also find acetylcholine. Now, a second neurotransmitter, norepinephrine, which is also known as noradrenaline, we will frequently find associated with the sympathetic postganglionic fibers. So acetylcholine for our preganglionic fibers, both on the parasympathetic and the sympathetic. Uh, acetylcholine in the postganglionic fibers, and then norepinephrine in the postganglionic fibers of the sympathetic nervous system. So acetylcholine and norepinephrine are primarily the um, neurotransmitters that we're going to find in use. Now the receptors. The receptors are going to be what differ between our different varieties of parasympathetic, sympathetic, and pre and post ganglion. Acetylcholine is going to bind to cholinergic receptors. And there are going to be two main types of cholinergic receptors. So two types of cholinergic receptors, so two types of receptors that acetylcholine can bind to. The first type is called a muscarinic receptor. And the muscarinic receptors, which you see an example here. Here's our synaptic cleft, and here's our postganglionic membrane. And you can see that we have an acetylcholine muscarinic M1 receptor. And so this is going to bind up to uh, the acetylcholine. We'll find form a ligand uh, receptor complex G protein interaction. You can see we're going to activate phospholipase base C. So this is going to be primarily a second messenger phospholipase C type mechanism. Now the muscarinic receptor was first discovered with a molecule called muscarin. Which is derived from mushrooms. It's a mushroom toxin. Hence the name muscarinic. We will find this type of receptor located in the myocardium, so cardiac tissue, and in many smooth muscles within a variety of different organs. We'll also find the muscarinic muscarinic receptor located in a variety of different glands. Again, acts primarily through second messenger systems. And 
And as we see in this figure, this is the M1 receptor. There's actually several different subclasses of muscarinic receptors. M1 subclass is just one possibility. And the reason that we have subclasses or the result of these subclasses is that we get more response variation. More possible types of responses. There's a second acetylcholine receptor called the nicotinic receptor. And we've actually already run into the nicotinic receptors. Uh, we found them in the uh, neuromuscular junction. This is the acetylcholine receptor that we're going to find in the skeletal muscle. And you can actually see that uh, the nicotinic receptor, when it binds acetylcholine, opens up and forms a channel and changes the voltage characteristics of the cytosol right up there by the membrane. Just like with the muscarinic receptor, this was discovered with a molecule we're all very familiar with, which is nicotine. This is the component in cigarettes that uh, make them addictive. Uh, this is a botanical toxin that we find from the tobacco leaf. The nicotinic receptor is going to be located in the synapses between the pre- and post-ganglionic fibers. Find nicotinic receptors located in the adrenal medulla. And then also located, of course, as we've already alluded to, in the neuromuscular junction. Now, the nicotinic receptor is always going to be excitatory. And again, it acts as a ligand gated channel. This is going to alter the postsynaptic potential. The voltage characteristics of the cell. All right, so we have the nicotinic receptor and we have the muscarinic receptor. Both of them are cholinergic receptors. They help to facilitate the function of acetylcholine. Norepinephrine. to be two types of receptors that interact with norepinephrine. Now these two types of receptors can also bind to epinephrine. The other name for epinephrine is adrenaline, so hence the name adrenergic. So we have two types of adrenergic receptors. They're going to be just uh, subtypes of alpha and the beta. So we'll have alpha adrenergic receptor and beta adrenergic receptor. The alpha is going to have two additional subclasses. The alpha-1 receptor. This particular receptor, which you can see an example of the alpha-1 receptor uh, here 
on the on this figure, and you can see that when epinephrine or norepinephrine binds, we have G protein that goes to phospholipase C. This ends up becoming a calcium signaling pathway for the production of IP3 and DAG and the release of calcium from sarcoplasmic in particulum and influx from the outside of the cell. So this alpha-1 will act by a calcium second messenger. And it will have an inhibitory effect. Second subtype of the alpha adrenergic receptor is going to be alpha 2 receptors. This particular receptor is going to decrease the synthesis of cyclic AMP. And so it's going to lift the effects of this second messenger system and will be excitatory. The second uh, class of energy receptors, so alpha and then beta energic receptors. Again, two subclasses. They're also going to be just beta 1, beta 2. Beta 1 receptors will have an inhibitory effect. Two receptors will have an excitatory effect. Both beta one and beta two receptors inducing an excitatory effect are going to act through cyclic AMP second messenger. That's what you can see in this figure here. The epinephrine receptor binds norepinephrine through a G-linked protein, uh, upregulates a downwheel cyclase to increase the production of cyclic AMP, and then we have our downstream effects. Now, the purpose of the autonomic nervous system acting through all of these receptors and neurotransmitters and then the anatomical organization of these fibers coming through the ganglion chain, the sympathetic ganglion chain, is to help to regulate reflexes in an autonomic or automatic way. And these reflexes, again, are going to be through a reflex part, and they are primarily going to be visceral reflexes. So the visceral organs make up a system of organs that respond to circumstances. And they respond to counter the effect of those circumstances to maintain homeostatic balance. And so I'm going to just break down one example of, of a uh, visceral reflex to sort of highlight the general use of the autonomic nervous system in humans. The example we're going to look at is blood pressure regulation. 
Unfortunately, you do not have to regulate your blood pressure. This happens all autonomically or automatically. Normal blood pressure is 110 over 70. If either of these two numbers increase or decrease significantly, we have to counter that effect or that change to try to maintain within those homeostatic limits. So we're going to choose to increase blood pressure for this example. So 110 may increase to 135, 140. As blood pressure increases, that change in pressure is constantly monitored through organs called the baroreceptors. And just like their name suggests, these respond to changes in pressure. Maybe you'll see baro and think barometer. The baroreceptors are located in the wall of the carotid artery. And as pressure changes, we generate a, si a signal. And this signal is going to be a action potential signal. So the action potential is going to be generated in the baroreceptor and is going to be transmitted through cranial nerve glossal pharyngeal. So glossal pharyngeal brings that signal up to the brain stem. And in particular, it's going to transmit that signal to the medulla oblongata. So as the signal makes its way, the action potential is carried up to the med medulla oblongata. You can see there in the medulla oblongata we have an inner neuron. And that little short neuron is going to receive the signal. We're going to have neurotransmission across that synapse. Receptors pick up that ligand and create a new action potential. So that signal is integrated and processed in the medulla oblongata, which will generate an action potential. An action potential is going to be stimulated. Now, the neural integration goes from glossal pharyngeal through the inner neuron into the cranial nerve vagus. So the nerve impulse will travel cranial nerve vagus. And that vagus nerve goes a variety of different places. One of the places that nerve innervates is the heart. And so that nerve signal we sent down the vagus nerve to the heart. At the very end of that particular nerve fiber, that neuron that interacts with the heart, the vagus nerve is going to release acetylcholine. And so in one sense, we can say that the vagus nerve is going to release acetylcholine over the heart, or is going to bathe acetylcholine in the heart. Now, the cardiac tissue, the cells of the heart contain muscarinic receptors. Those muscarinic receptors are going to be bound by the acetylcholine that's being released from the vagus nerve.
Now, as you'll remember, the muscarinic receptor typically leads to a second messenger system. A lot of times it'll be a calcium second messenger system. And so we'll change calcium flow in the heart. If we reduce calcium flow into the heart, this reduces heart rate. If we reduce the heart rate, the results are to have a concomitant decrease in blood pressure. 